Thì hôm nay đây để kính mời quý vị theo dõi phần thông báo Thông báo của chương trình Nhân viện Đa Văn Hóa thuộc tổ chức từ thiện CT Mission Chương trình này đang nỗ lực giúp đỡ người Việt Nam định cư tại Úc đặc biệt trong vấn đề giáo dục Chương trình này là synonymous as myself, really And uh, I feel most happy with making my films And uh, if now the label art is put onto it uh, That's up to whoever puts that label on Maybe it's a miracle or what, I have no idea, but it's just there. The images just they come flying to me. I was uh, you know, born in Germany in 1939 and uh, I came out to Australia in 1959, so I was just about um, 20 years uh, of age when I hit here uh, in Melbourne to start off with. Where I come from, art was something, uh, you know, just, it, I know it didn't exist. The only thing I remember as children, they gave us some crayons and to do some paintings, if you like, scribbling, and so, but that, that was about, but uh, that's it. I, uh, later on in high school and so on, there was no art whatsoever. We didn't even go to museums or anything like that. That, that didn't exist. There was only uh, there was reading, writing and arithmetic. That was it. So, you know, and that's why I never had any background on art whatsoever. My point of departure came when I finished my apprenticeship as a bricklayer. And, and our teachers told us it won't be long now that the army will probably knock on your door. And that sort of made me think, well, I wasn't really keen on that. And then we looked at it in Australia and I said, well, that sounds pretty good. So, and uh, being a bricklayer, it's always nice weather. And that was the deciding factor. On the boat, well, I got to know quite a lot of people my age. And uh, funny enough, this is the first time I met people who had cameras. And I'm talking about still cameras. Now, to me, a camera, as a child, I had a box brownie and I took a few photos, but uh, that would have been about the end of it. But these people here, particularly one friend of mine, he had quite a, what I thought, quite a good camera, and so he taught me a little bit, and I decided then, well, that's really fun to make photos. I soon figured out, well, with being a bricklayer, and I started to like the lifestyle here because you could, in those days, you could get a job anywhere. And you finish one job, and you got enough money in your pocket, and you stop working simply, and uh, you just either go to the beach or traveling around or whatever. And when the money ran out, we just got another job, you see. So the, uh, there was never any sort of, uh, to settle down and uh, stay with one outfit. I said, no way, because that was the way in Germany. But I said, when I learned here in this country, it works very differently. You get where the drops are, drop finish, and you go with so somewhere else. That suited me much better. And uh, that actually then became virtually uh, the way I sort of lived my life ever since. And I just went, you know, wherever there was a good job. Because I had no really big money, I started to buy uh, my first 8mm camera and you know I never looked back because also everything was moving and they said wow it's moving you know that then a little projector and a little editor and uh, yeah and then all of a sudden I started to get a liking for it. A couple of friends and we decided to go back to Germany and uh, to work there for a while and then come back but on the way make a documentary. We didn't even know they were talking about, just a travel film. And so we bought a motorbike, and uh, then this fellow and myself, uh, I was the cameraman, he was a driver. So I, f you know, I filmed everything to the different countries we traveled to. So. And then I cut the film, and I think I had about 20 years, if I remember, of 8 millimeter. And then people looked at it, like the first people I traveled with, and thought, oh, and then more and more got more and more of an audience for that film. And then uh, some church organization, so some of them saw the film and we had their hall and we showed the film in there. And so it went you know, from place to place. Uh, we even put an ad in the paper and uh, people actually came to look at this film. I 
I have no idea about the history of uh, cinema whatsoever, or of, of camera work, or anything to do with the movies you see in the movie house. That was a complete different ball game. I mean, it's only it occurred to me much later that, hey, there must be more to it than just pressing a button. And uh, I found, soon I found out that the uh, preparation to make a film takes a lot longer than the actual uh, doing of making the film. And so hence I bought myself time. It never occurred to me to make a living out of that, but I felt what else can I do uh, after I made that film? And then I started to make, uh, I, I then became more serious about the main nature of film, and I joined the Film Society. And it was the Workers' Educational Association, which was a pretty, it was a pretty left-leaning bunch of people sitting in that little, in that audience. There were never very many people, so maybe 20, 25, 30. Uh, as it turns out, a lot of these people, uh, at, unbeknown to me at the time, they all seem as intellectuals. I had no idea actually at that time what that word really meant. A little by little I realized, you know, what they were talking about, I had to relearn actually. So I had to go back and learn everything about the, the business of making movies and the intellectual side of movies, the history of movies, and what uh, people used and the reasons they had to make the movies. And of course, who do you come across? Eisenstein. When he talked about his intellectual montage, and I hear really something happened in my head then, you know, and I thought, this, this is the way to go, I figured, you know, because he made, the sense he made in his writing was really terrific. I didn't see that much later in his films, but then he changed it, he became more of a historical filmmaker, but at the beginning, like, it's a film called Strike, i never get that, it was a silent movie, but the way he associated images with the people and the statues and so on, and uh, that sort of really uh, made me think about that. And uh, so I figured, yeah, that's, that's, that is another way. Because I knew I didn't want to make films with actors. That I knew straight away, where the hell do I go? In those days, I'm talking about in the 60s. And nobody wants to make films in this country as far as I know, except uh, the odd film maybe, or you set the news feed. Actually, real films like well, eight millimeter and short films. And one day they asked me, "Yeah, can I show them here?" And I and I showed them. And in fact, I remember that the film I showed. The film is called Mood, and everybody was quite Jesus. You know, hmm. Well, they, they they were quite surprised actually. They all said, "Well, you're not getting very far with these films, you know." Like I don't know whether they meant it in a commercial way. Well, I said, "No, this is just something, you know." I can, uh, I can, I feel good about it if I make this. It's just all my work, my camera work, and script, everything. And uh, well, it, it for a while there was a question in my own head. You know, will I go anywhere with these films? And so, of course, in '67, then all of a sudden, I said, well, I then became very interested in documentary films. Switch into 60 millimeter and make this film isolated, and uh, you know, I, at the time it's a film which you know observes the uh, people who are in a bad way, like the drunks or those days, and people sitting in wheelchairs and spastic and had to uh, earn money by literally panhandling or begging and asking people for money. And I thought it was very, very sad, really. <laughs> Sort of, uh, you know, so so of a reception. I came in contact with the uh, American underground filmmaking that we only ever heard that through the newspapers, and then I saw a program of the underground filmmakers, which came over from America, obviously. And then I realized, you know, well, <coughs> what they, uh, the expression of filmmakers there was, was I felt very uh, somehow. I said, yeah, that that could be me actually. 
I can I sort of express myself with my own language and uh, just have to invent my own film language. And that sort of made me uh, go in a film, a film called Neurosis. And the film in those days was about the Vietnam War. <laughs> That film was uh, feeling much, very much uh, an expressionist film where I sh swung the camera around and I did things which you normally don't do, you know, in those days at least, don't do documentary films. But uh, if I found that that film actually had such a punch, uh, it was then uh, shown into a lot of schools and actually hired that film. And uh, snippets were shown on television and so somehow I knew well, that's, you know, it's, it's a, a way for me to go forward. And, but more and more, and I became, if you like, a little bit more abstract. I thought I'm actually more adventurous or more advanced, actually. I didn't see myself adventurous. I thought more advanced, simply because when I looked at something, I said, well, how can I interpret that particular scene there or that particular object? You know, you know if you see a flower pot there, well, you can interpret it many different ways. It's like a painter, so very, I can painted in the evening or night time or all on a different light and it always looks different. And I said, well, why can't as a filmmaker, can't I use uh, material and make it look different for, to suit a particular emotional impact? storyline which had to be pretty self-evident so that the audience would follow it and I figured if I my own film which I then started to make I said, well, they, for me they had a storyline and I found that okay not everybody probably can follow that storyline but they get in that impact from the images themselves I did not want to become a director or producer for making feature films or, or the particular feature films said, no, no way, no way. I need something that I can relax and not mind myself, no deadlines. So I have a friend who is a painter actually, that's, that's one of the things. And I said, look, and I said to him, you, you really got to make, you sit in your studio and you paint and then you can shut everything out. And uh, so I want to do something like that, but I can't paint. And so we talked about it and I said, okay, I'll make films. And uh, because with films I can sit there and do it myself and f I feel happy with that. On the building side, you know, I have lots of people around me. Now, to go to narrative filmmaking, I said, Jesus Christ, I've become another building site again. Because you can, not only do you have all the actors, technicians and all that, I said, I said, no, this, 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 this will not suit me at all. But that, that's only the beginning of the film, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's how I try things out. But then later on, when I do my mutting for argument's sake, you know, I might say, okay, I don't, I want that image I want inside this. So what I do is, you know, I put it here and you can see all of a sudden, you see that. Uh -huh. And then where it's black, I put another image around there, you see. So these are more or less 
I thought the beginning of something when I try try it out is here's another image. You see different cutouts. You see, you see it there. When people uh, say you make art, I never saw this as art because for, for me, an artist was someone who paints. You know, now of course I know this is not the case anymore. But so when I kicked off this filmmaking, the artist that was somebody who is an artist. He has a paint brushes and the canvas, etc. And then you look at it, it's oh, great, you know, and or oh, a sculptor. So uh, that that to me was seen as art. Now what we did with the film camera. I never saw this as, as art at all. To me, it was simply which something that's moving on the screen there. But as it's a film, it's the uh, expression of art as filmmaker. I don't know when that came actually into being, but uh, definitely when I kicked off, I never heard that. someone comes along and cuts me off, you know, I'd be screaming. And that's really what I wanted to show. In those days, scars on the environment, because there, no one, there were no greens around them, you know, these so-called green people were not around them. I was, even in Germany, I showed it there, actually, and uh, when I talked about, uh, to the audience about, you know, the uh, destruction of trees in Australia, in this particular case, to make a roadway, you know. But I said, this is, this, they all just, cut down these trees for pipe and stuff like that, you know, the whole forest is just simply disappearing. And that was a subject matter which nobody actually took much notice of in those days, you see. That film had a strong subject matter, you know, the Australian Aborigines finally standing up and wanting some rights for the land. And uh, so it would be quite, quite a powerful film. And that film was just recently shown in Canada, actually, uh, a great they sent me with some money for that, I couldn't believe it. <laughs> the, the hiring fee of eighty two dollars. many years I've made films now, uh, I've found a way where I can express certain feelings I have against or with certain subject matters and I find a new way of interpreting it. And uh, well, that, that was like a revelation to me then and I found this field was very wide open and very few people actually did that or could do it to start with because I became much better and better with the camera and uh, also my visual seeing became f so much better. I could look at something and I can already see it as a film virtually. And so the means of making these films became very cheap. So I could construct all the images first in my head, a little script on the piper, and uh, then I got my camera out. And generally I always, well, when I was traveling around and showed my friends, I told the audience, after the first hundred feet when I made experiments, just to see whether it'll work, and whether then maybe 10 or 15 percent did work, the rest was not so good. But that was enough for me then to go on to finish with this particular uh, project. I mean, I, I have all kinds of different setups. This is just another one which I just developed. You see, so every film I make, I have and yet another setup. This this is all a uh, just a, a tool to let me know how approximately. Uh, my images will run, but uh, th this this is a, a real McCoy then. So uh, this is in the 16mm film sitting in the camera. about Brickwall, we had a was shown in the co-op and all the uh, people from the film industry came along too. We had an evening of so-called experimental film and they said uh, we were just recently funded by the uh, Australian Film Commission and after my film was shown you could have hear the pin drop. They just didn't know what to say, you know, it was so strange, you know. called 
Park Rhine, it's a 30 minutes, and that's where I think I was most successful in uh, really creating a sound in image film, or where you don't know whether you see the images or whether the sound are images or image into sound. It's something which uh, has always interested me, you know, how far you can actually push the single frame and in this case it de deals with insects and the leaves and, and the trees and grass and flowers and we know they can't, they have to exist with each other otherwise because of two pollination so there is this uh, eternal life cycle going on and uh, I thought that film captured it very well so and it was one of the, also one of my longest films by 30 minutes most of the films, my films are shorter but in this film to me, uh, even though it's a bit hard to look at but I think uh, it's, it, punch, it really sort of, every time I look at it, it really gets me going. It's not a very, very abstract film, and strangely enough, uh, it has become also, well, I think, one of my most popular films, because I had people ring me up sometimes to see the film and wanted to talk to me about the film, and uh, I showed it in America, and the Australian ambassador had a few tears in his eyes when he saw the film at the embassy there, so, and now it's been used, uh, there's now going to Norway now, someone there's been other film, a group of avant-garde filmmakers, uh, they show that film and some other films. So it has captured very strongly, I think, that feeling I had at the time to, when I first laid eyes on one line. Artwork here, you see. That's how it is. It's, it's, the, uh, I guess it's quite a package there, you see. It just, it just so happened that I felt so deeply about what was going on in this little area here by the graffiti. I just had to do it, you know. And so, and I found a way of showing it by making, constructing images which are quite, how should I say, they really grab you. And that's the thing, you see. So, where does it come from? People always ask me that, you know, when I even when I was on traveling, you know, where do all these, uh, not just the ideas come from, but then to package these ideas into these images, which bring these ideas forward, but in a quite a remarkable way. On the, on the back of my studio, you see, that's the white, that's the door, and that's the, the corrugated iron, and here the idiots that put all this graffiti on, you see, and here you see it again, uh, the iron and the, the door, you see, so they deface the, uh, the back of my studio, and that's that's where, and here you can see some more graffiti, it's just, well, actually this is really what they call tags, it's not even graffiti in the sense, it's just rubbish. How do these images come about? And when I said to you, it's to do, obviously, in the environment we live, but also what's happening around the world, all the news. So all this leaves an imprint somehow. And all these things which are co you're constantly bombarded with all kinds of uh, stuff.
sent films to a film festival in uh, America, the Ann Arbor Film Festival. And I think I probably submitted four or five films there because I never actually sent any films to that festival and I was wondering, you know, where I could send these films to, what festival. And much to my surprise, you know, uh, they accepted all the films and uh, the curator from the Museum of Modern Art was sitting in the audience and soon after, you know, I think a week later, I uh, was contacted by them and they said, look, Mr. Wittner, we uh, like if you show me, we saw your film, we were very, very, very impressed with your film work and where have you been all that time? I said, well, they said, this is the first time actually I sent these films overseas. And there was another fellow, Howard Gattenplan, in the Manilio in uh, New York. And uh, he actually, I, he had given me a show without seeing the films. And he said to me also, look, here at the museum, actually likes your films. And it was not much longer after that, uh, they said, look, no, I think we want to buy your films. And I was very, very surprised by that, you know. And they said, no, they, uh, what you've got there, there's really something there. So, yeah, I think they bought about 15 you know, of my films, which of course, to me, was quite something, you know, coming from nowhere. In those days, of course, uh, remember the uh, National Library in Canberra, they, uh, they didn't think all that much of the so-called experimental films. And, uh, well, you know, when they found out later that my films are now in the museum, you see, they uh, started to buy some of my films too then. Experimental, they had so many different uh, names for that. You know, he then avant garde, self expression film, or homemade movies, they had all kinds of names which were put onto films which you couldn't quite classify. And uh, experimental somehow or another became the big, well, it still is. It seems to be, if you can't really place it anywhere, then you go, it's experimental. Even so, I think that word is not very good because. These films are not really an experiment. They're actually well sought out. So that experimental film is just as part of the genre of film language now. It don't necessarily mean that someone doesn't know what that person is doing. It just has become that label. And then I realized that uh, reading about the Holocaust and how these trains brought these people to the concentration camps. And trains, so what I use trains are good, you can go on holiday with them, but also do the trains can also bring people into bad situations. And all of a sudden that's a trigger of a uh, film, just using a toy train. So, uh, but it's, it's just what's behind all that triggers off then actually a big story somewhere for me. And all of a sudden then, hey man, you got another film there, you see. The content to me is really important because the content is what's, what has affected me. And uh, then I look for the uh, mechanical means of how to interpret this content and how that make into a film.
look at the why the stories are doing, you know, they can have up to 13 sound effects on one scene. You can do the same too if if you will wish to build so many sound effects. You see, like you can have talking, you know, three effects there. You see, and then a bit of music is four effects, playing five effects. You know, so you can you add layer on layer on layer on layer on layer. You see, in fact, I did one film uh, where I was actually adding probably something like thirty sound effects on top of each other. This was a film where I was using the, my voice. I had a word, uh, like, I think I remember the word was golf, G-O-L-F. And then as I was talking, that was repeating and repeating, and then laying it on top of it, and then it became almost like music. I did the same with an image, too. You can lay images on top of each other, refilming it and winding back and refilming and so I did that over 200 times and that image now is not that original image anymore you know it becomes something in itself and becomes from that original image you slay you know, slowly you see it is integrating but it becomes entirely a new image and uh, which doesn't exist in reality but it derives from your original image And now you watch, now comes the, see that's the tail, but that has to be cut off then, you see. I'm making a film now, and you know, it's a shredder, it's a shredding machine. All of a sudden, Jesus Christ, this, this could be doing, I could do something with that. And what's the shredding machine do? It shreds papers. <laughs> and uh, so the next one, that's it. This sort of work, no, no, shredding paper. So it's it's these are things where I see certain things, uh, mechanical things, and uh, what do they do, and how do they, uh, what can I do with them? Oops, there it goes. Uh. You see, <laughs> so that's the film down down the hatch. If I put this through, I'll never see this again. Oh. Right, because it uses a sword, it just gets yeah. in lots of pieces. Oh. But so when, but when I put my video camera there, I stick it in, and the video camera will actually photographing as it goes into the shredder, and the film camera will actually photograph just the actual shredding process. So there are two things going there. You see. When you look at it, some of those uh, experiments of his are like basic exercises in the nature of the motion picture medium. And sad to say, we're now at the point where we can look back on a century of motion picture filmmaking. And the truth is that a number of the expressive possibilities that this medium has are little understood and until Paul Winkler not even explored. Since uh, I can't get any more 60 millimeter prints because that's the laboratory I used to work with, they stopped it now because everything is going digital now. I'll probably, you know, have to go that way. Yes, I would imagine so. It's not just it's another technique I have to learn, but I think some or another I might that find that quite useful because I may be able to use it to my own liking. And uh, I'm actually looking forward to see how this will all work out. And uh, with my dexterity, I think I'll get there. It's just, it won't be the same as film, but it will be a di different way of showing something or making something. And uh, only the future will tell how that will play out. I can't tell it at the moment, but uh, it has to be seen.